So everybody want to say thank you so much for joining. We got a pretty exciting call for today, um, and especially following last week's call, which was, which was awesome. Today we're going to dig in a little bit on healthcare, and our special guest speaker is awesome. He comes right from Silicon Valley. Uh, he started one of the preeminent uh, remote working applications that you're going to find. So you're going to learn all about that. I am Jeremy. I am from the Equilibrium Ventures team. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've started a number of real estate technology companies. Uh, some of them have had uh, quite a bit of success. Uh, when COVID comes back to life, you'll be able to use one of my apps, Spot Hero, to find your parking spot. I spend every single day now uh, doing real estate and investing with Itai. Itai, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, hey guys, uh, I'm Itai. Uh, I uh, very briefly, a while back, started at UBS. Afterwards, I founded a uh, co-founded a wealth management group as well as a hedge fund that specializes in options location. Had a pretty decent track record. Then I co-founded Equilibrium Ventures here with Jeremy, where uh, we do a lot of investing. Um, we do some multifamily real estate and we do some um, some general investing in the, in the stock market. Thank you so much for that. And uh, the, the call of what we're going to talk about today are a few things. So one, we're going to talk about healthcare. So we haven't talked about it yet. Um, we're going to figure out, you know, is this a real issue with this recession and why is it a drag on any type of potential recovery. We're gonna talk about, has the stock market peaked? Uh, it's one, been one of the questions that everybody's asking, you know, am I in too late? Is there still more pain to come? We're gonna give you a quick update on that. We'll talk about margin debt, um, what it is and, and how it impacts stock market returns. We'll talk about liquidity and money markets. Then we've got our guest speaker. So if that's all that we've got for now, I would say Itai, um, Tell us a little bit about healthcare and is this a real issue for this recession or not? Right. So last time uh, we left us off at demographics and uh, then we had a great guest speaker, Mike Dever, to come in and talk about his way of investing. So um, basically we've seen how demographics has been sort of a drag with the fact that we've had baby boomers that are generally an older population. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how it impacts healthcare today and how it all relates. So going back to econ one on one, if any of you remember GDP, what is GDP divided into? We have consumption, right? We have government spending, we have investment, and then we have exports. All that together equals the gross domestic product. So everybody's talking about, hey, you know, GDP is contracted by 8%. In the, in the second quarter, uh, that was the revision. Maybe it's going to be more, maybe it's going to be less. But the whole point is in order to come up with, from a recession and have a healthy economy, we, we do need a lot of, we, de we need some kind of GDP growth. So in America, as of today, the consumption part of GDP actually accounts to, for 68%. So around a little bit more than two third of all, you know, all GDP is actually consumer spending. How does that relate to healthcare and how does that relate to demographics? Well, let's, let's take a look. So let me share the screen right there. So if we're looking here into consumer spending as a part of GDP, we can see that right there, it's sitting at 68%. But what's interesting is that consumer spending, if you take out healthcare, which is the red chart right here, actually is 54%. So we've seen that even though consumer spending in, in general as a part of GDP has been trending up over time, the amount of consumer spending as of GDP that is besides healthcare has trended flat for decades. That hasn't changed. And the fastest growing segment of consumption is in fact healthcare. So healthcare spending as a part of GDP has accelerated with time. And I attribute that a lot to the fact we have this aging population in relation to other segments of the population. So it's a big, it's a big impact. So you talk about the, the, you talk about the, the aging population. I mean, we still have 20 to 30 more years of, you know, the, the, the boomers, you know, stay, staying around. Uh, how feasible is it for this trend to continue and keep going up? And at what point does, does this turn around? I mean, I, I don't know necessarily at what point this turns around, but, um, I think it's a real issue that healthcare is such a major, major part of, uh, of consumer spending 
because we live in a society where based on, you know, Forbes uh, research done about a couple of years ago, 78% of, of US is living paycheck to paycheck. Um, Bank of America research from last year saying about 40 to 45% of people can come up with an emergency $500 that's not spent based on credit. So in order to grow consumption, we need to have um, some discretionary spending power in, in order to boost GDP. And the fact that healthcare is becoming such an, an enormous amount of the cost. Now, post COVID, it's even more of an issue because people are gonna see a healthcare as something that they really can't go without. And um, I think this is one of the bigger drags we have on any kind of sustained recovery in GDP or any kind of real GDP growth like that four or 5% we've seen decades ago. So why is this gonna be a drag on a recovery? Well, if you're spending so much on healthcare, it's going to be very difficult to spend on something else. And, um, you know, just the part of the part of healthcare costs as a part of GDP is just staggering. Got it. Got it. Any, uh, any questions from, from the group related to these two graphs? Okay, cool. Um, Itai last week, uh, or well, one of the questions that's been coming up is, you know, has the stock market, you know, peaked last week and are we at a temporary top? Could you give us a little color on that? Right. So I think we spoke a lot about the Fed and um, what the Fed has been doing, how much asset buying they've really been doing. Um, and I think that relates a lot to that question. So I want to revisit what that, what that was and you know, where we are sitting today, because I think that's important in understanding um, whether or not the market has peaked or not. So here is, and this is one of the charts we've shown in the first, in the first time or two we've had the, the, this call. Um, we've seen the stock market here in red and how it correlates to the Federal Reserve balance sheet here in blue. So generally speaking, the growth in the balance sheet has seen similar growth in the stock market, which is not surprising. So I wanted to look at the actual schedule of the Fed purchases that has happened right now from the beginning of this new round of QE. So we've had the beginning of coronavirus and then the, the Fed just up their, their daily purchases to, this is 100 billion by the way, so 125 billion or so. Not surprisingly, March 23rd was actually the day we bottomed out in the market. And um, a ton of, a ton of liquidity injection taking place. And as the markets begin to trend up and stabilize, the Fed is reducing their, their purchases. And right now we're actually only at $10 billion a day. So the amount of daily liquidity that's going into the system has significantly dropped as I think they've figured that we've seen some kind of stability going on and, um, and they've reduced the purchases. So that tells me that um, the conditions now for a decline could, could be greater if um, some investors start selling into strength. There's less less liquidity going on daily from the Fed in order to prevent um, to prevent uh, a bigger fall in the market. Got one it. question. One quick question, ET, is based on what happened in 2008, 2009. The Fed took a lot longer to start doing QE and all you know the injections and 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 of course the government's. Um, stimulus packages was the thought this time that based upon what happened in 2008 2009 that they wanted to hit it a lot faster with both barrels so having said that or asked that you know how much more gunpowder do they have in the barrel um, interesting thing you mentioned so uh, three weeks ago or so we we said that you know they've decided they're gonna buy um, high-yield bonds right and uh, they were talking about high yield bonds, but so far from what I've heard, they haven't bought any. It was it was all it was all jawboning to say we're going to do this to get to get support into the market. So I think they still can do that. They can still buy um, they could still buy high yield bonds. They can still buy investment grade bonds, and they can potentially even buy equities if they wanted to. And where did you get that information that they haven't gone out and purchased bonds yet? Honestly, I've, I've seen it from a tweet from, uh, from uh, Jeff Gonlack. Okay. Well, that's, a pretty, that's, a pretty reliable, <laughs> that's a pretty reliable source. If you don't know Jeff Gonlack, he's, uh, he's pretty serious. And so, you know, and when we're looking also at this, we're looking also at this graph, the one that, that, that you have of the Fed Treasury spend, to get a context of around March 23rd, those four, those 
those five, six days, the size of how big that was, that was basically the size of QE program number one over the course of six, seven days. Yeah, so just to understand the, the, the staggering size of what's going on here, this is 100 billion uh, per day. And um, year in 08, I mean, the Fed balance sheet was at 800 billion. And in the first, first part right there, it goes to 1200, uh, which is 1.2 trillion. I mean, we've done that in four days. Wow, that's incredible. So that just tells you that the rate, the rate they're doing it is really unprecedented. And they really have tried to throw a ton of liquidity into the market and kind of see what happens. Um, so, so when you, so we, we have Chris, uh, Chris asking from, from, from the audience. So are we screwed from this? Well, it, <laughs> I see it, Rob laughing too. It depends. It depends if you're in the side that makes money in wages and it erodes away or you're in the side of people that, you know, enjoy the uh, asset price appreciation, right? That's very true. And we'll, and we're, and we're going to talk about that a little bit when we get into liquidity. Um, one of the, uh, you know, when you take a look at it from this, from a trading perspective, uh, there's certain, uh, certain ratios that are very, uh, that hold very true in nature. And it seems like, uh, there's a little tie into what's happening right now with the top to that. Do you want to speak to the Fibonacci numbers? Yeah. So I will, I will bring into the possibility that we may have a short-term top and I'll talk about why and why from that level. So on one end, we've seen that the daily purchases have dropped to under 10 billion. And that, um, that on, the, on its own says that, you know, I, I, I am a believer that you don't fight the Fed. So if the Fed is pumping $125 billion every single day into the system, that's not a market that I want to particularly short, right? Um, but on the other end, when the Fed is doing less than $10 billion, we may have a climate for a temporary top. And we've spoken in, uh, in, in previous calls that in the past, when we have large drops in asset prices like we've seen here, usually go into an extended period of volatility. And you're kind of looking for that, that VIX not making a same high if we have a retrace or kind of like a lower high or something like that. So I know that in nature, you have these Fibonacci ratios. I'm not going to go too deep into it because we can have an eight hour conversation about it. But you see these ratios and the spiral of galaxies and in, in flowers and what, what have you. So you have a lot of people that believe that that, that same ratio repeats itself in the financial markets. Now, I'm not necessarily going to sit here and tell you that I believe that too. But what I do believe is that if enough people believe that that's the case, they program it into their trading algorithms, they program it into their charts, and sometimes it happens because a lot of programs are just saying, hey, if it gets to this number, just sell. And that's kind of the case sometimes. So we can see here if we measure the top of the, uh, of the market all the way through to the bottom right there, uh, last week, we've literally almost to the penny reached that 61.8 number. And then we started selling off from there. Um, if enough people believe it's the case, I'm not going to fight that either. So the likelihood of having potentially a little more volatility in, in here with a little bit less Fed, Fed purchases and, uh, and uh, Fibonacci number hitting, you know, could, could very well be. Very cool. Uh, how are we doing, audience, right now? Any, uh, we've we got a good pace going. We got any questions? 10 billion still sounds like a lot. Was it zero prior to February? No, it was about 10 billion, 10 to 12. That's just the norm that since they kind of started it. 10 billion is not a lot at all, if you really okay. think about it. Um, well, so it was 10 billion prior to this crisis. So they're just back to business as usual. No, I mean, so, so in 2018, they were doing what's called QT. By the way, uh, nice beard. <laughs> from, one, from one bearded man to another i see you guys have this insider game going all right so um anyway uh what what um what we've seen actually we can go back to that to that chart there um so in march 13 we were actually we we're actually the 40-ish billion and the market was still going down but uh, there was there was QT programs in 2018, so it actually they were actually trying to contract the balance sheet. That didn't work out very well for them, and the market dropped 20% into December 2018. Then they just stopped the QT programs. Um, then the market started slowly trending back up, and then um, they were resuming the QE programs in the beginning of coronavirus. It took over 100 billion a day to to find a bottom and stabilize it. 10 billion on a relative basis is really not a lot. If enough 
trading programs are selling on a given day, they can even e e easily overcome that. That makes sense. So if, if you were, if you were the fad and you were thinking about ramping this up again, what types of things would you be looking to see to make you say, all right, time for more QE pumping in? I mean, I wouldn't, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't intervene that much in, um, you know, in, in, in the free market as the way they do just personally. Uh, I, you know, if, if a real end of, I, I think they were really panicking that we're having a real end of the world moment going on and they really felt the need to inject an insane amount of money into the system because they were, they were thinking about just broad defaults going on and things like that. Got it. Got it. And yes, the sirens did add to that, uh, that QE intervention. Um, it's part of uh, being stuck in our homes still. Although Texas is somewhat opening up again, we did have a dinner at a restaurant. So yes, I'm a horrible person, everybody, but we did it and we enjoyed it and we felt like human beings again. Uh, so speaking of uh, some people having liberties that other people don't have, let's talk about margin debt. What is margin debt and how does it impact stock returns? So in the, the broadest way of thinking about it, right? If you have a thousand dollars and you want to invest in the stock market, um, you can think about it in the way that you can just buy a thousand dollars worth of stock, but that's not the case because you can borrow money from your broker and that rate of borrow varies based on the interest rate environment and what kind of stock you're trying to buy or sell short, for example. And you can buy more than what you actually have. So if you borrow a thousand dollars to buy more stock, you can buy $2,000 worth of stock with $1,000. And that amplifies stock returns in a big way. So it's a double-edged sword, right? If the market goes up and things are great uh, and you buy your apples and Amazons on borrowed money, you, you make a lot more money than you would otherwise, right? And um, in this case, if you borrowed 100%, you had 1,000, you, you, you borrowed $1,000. Now the stock market's down 25%. Then in fact, you lose 50%, right? because you lose 25% on the borrowed money and you lose 25% on your real money. So uh, that's kind of how it adds up. So it adds as an amplifier in both returns on the upside and downside. Got it. Rob's got a little history last thing. He said in 1920s, you could put 5% down to trade stocks. Well, in, in, in some foreign exchange markets, you can put a dollar to trade $100 worth of FX. Interesting. So do you want to... Um, so when we talk about uh, margin debt, are there any types of, uh, of graphs that you can share that'll kind of help people understand this a little bit better? Yeah, absolutely. So um, this, is, this is an interesting chart. We can see that the Wilshire 5000 in blue, that's a br very broad um, view of the stock market and margin debt in billions here in the red. So we can see that these two correlate really, really well. Markets rise up, people feel like they need to borrow more money and buy more stock. And as they trend down, people liquidate some forced liquidation, some non-forced liquidations. Um, so we actually peaked on margin debt way before the markets did, which is interesting. Um, and we've trended down with this COVID situation um, as, as a lot of forced selling was in fact taking place. So it's an interesting thing because we don't necessarily know what kind of move in the stock market is driven by actual dollars going into stocks versus borrowed dollars going into stocks. And understanding that is, is a good thing in understanding what really drives returns. A lot of people say, well, returns are driven by valuation, but I would say returns are potentially driven by liquidity. Because um, sometimes people are willing to accept 20 PE ratios for stocks, and sometimes they're willing to accept 15 PE ratios for stocks. And that environment totally changes all the time. And um, understanding the liquidity and, and margin situation is, is a good tool to understanding the stock market. Uh, Itai, when does margin become really dangerous? What, what, what has to happen and, and how does that play out? So I think when a lot of the return is driven by borrow dollars, that's potentially a dangerous situation. Like a lot of people say that the big moves in the 1920s happened because there was just so much margin borrowing and that was a relatively new thing. People didn't understand that correctly and eventually caused a, a really big crash. Um, I actually am saying that today's mark margin situation is not, is not terrible. Um, and here I wanna, I wanna actually look at an interesting way to look at, because we can look at margin and this, as this red line is just like the broad amount of margin out there. 
But we can also look at margin as just the percentage of the actual stock market to understand because the stock market with inflation continues to go up, right? And inflate away over, over time. So if we're looking at margin that is just a straight out percentage from the market, here it is in 95 all the way through to today, it's pretty much in the mean, it's not, it's not terrible. So here in the 90s, we have this growth in margin. This, it's pretty easy to see that tech bubble going up here as margin goes pretty crazy and then it deflates um, into 2002. It inflates again in 06, 07. Um, and then notice that all post crash as a percentage margin that stayed relatively uh, high, maybe because rates were just so low to borrow stocks. Um, and then it started kind of deflating again, even though markets were not, were not necessarily um, going down at that time. Maybe markets went up so much and borrowing didn't increase as much, but margin debt as far as a percentage of the stock market is not particularly high today versus other historical periods. How, you know, it didn't, yeah, I know a lot of the uh, declines in the, in, in the prices of stocks were when these margin calls hit in March. Um, right. It doesn't really look, though, that this graph really uh, reflects that margin debt really went down to to close out those positions. Well, keep in mind, keep in mind that the market was going down, too. So this is margin debt as a percentage of the market, but the market was down 37 percent. That makes a ton, that makes a that makes a lot of sense. Um, and in terms of uh, borrow rates, what are you seeing in terms of for the people that want to get margin? What types of rates are you seeing in the marketplace? Sub one percent. Um, through, uh, through, for example, interactive brokers, which we're using, uh, as our custodian, we're able to borrow as low as 0.77%. So that's kind of crazy. So the people right now who are sitting on cash can be borrowing up to what 80% of their portfolio at less than 1% interest rate. That's correct. That is absolutely nuts. So for people who have been thinking about that or been hearing other your financial advisors say that you can get access to margin. We just want to let you know that that's kind of the rate that we are actually hearing that's out there. Um, one of the quick questions, and I know I'm going to ask this because we have a few professional gamblers, or not professional gamblers, we have a few professional sports bettors um, on the call right now. Uh, Rob asked, Rob, you want to ask your question outright? So one, of, so one of the speculations, uh, articles that I read this week or last week was that all these people stuck at home that a lot of the sports gamblers are playing the dips and throwing, I just don't think they have that much money to move markets, but that that's been one of the, uh, one of the things that have been going on to, to hold up the market is a lot of people, because they have no sports to bet on, they're going to play something, they're doing Texas Hold'em and they're playing the stock market right now. So let's, uh, let's pose this question. Um, Paul or Matt, do either of you have any insights uh, from this in the circles that you roll in? Uh, well, I know of some friends that have been playing options, like very degenerately, which uh, I'm not sure that has any positive or negative effect on the prices, but I've kind of told them like, yeah, you should probably not do that. I don't know if, I think, I think Eddie can answer this too, but I don't know if I have, um, been been putting more than average uh, amount of money in the stock market. I'm, I am still trying to bet on anything I can, though, whether it's Russian table tennis or esports. So, <laughs> Russian table tennis. That's great. Really? <laughs> so, I, at this point, I'll watch anything. Just send me the link, okay? For real. Exactly. Yeah. So for everybody else, just go watch uh, the Last Dance for all of us Chicago people. It's a it's a it's a period of nostalgia. Um. Cool. Anybody else, uh, any other questions that, that we're seeing uh, as it relates to margin debt? Anybody, uh, anybody else out there want to ask something? Okay, cool. Yeah, can I ask, Jeremy? Absolutely can. I, I just what I asked in the, there was a little bit of chat uh, in, the, in the text. I'm just curious, like I've never used margin debt. Is it opportunity cost for me not to be doing it? Or is it like, so that really depends on what you're investing in, right? Because if you can potentially secure a return of three to four percent in some kind of, you know, bonds that you can hedge against with a put option, so you already know your cost of hedge in advance and you know your drawdown in advance, if you can borrow against it for one percent or less and buy more of it because you know what your hedge is and you know exactly your risk parameters 
um, you can just play the interest rate differentials between the money that you're making and the money that you're borrowing at. And there's really sophisticated, smart ways of doing it. Yeah. And also it sounds like based on your previous note that there might be some type of arbitrage there between the interest rate that's being hit up on your wife's student loan debt and, and that. So maybe a uh, margin, margin uh, could be something interesting. Cool. All right, Itai, uh, with margin comes questions of liquidity and money markets. You want to walk us through that a little bit before we hop into talking to Shahid? Right. So this is something that I know it's going to take a lot of people by surprise. Um, I look at the broad amount of liquidity that is in, in, in the system in general as a way to kind of gauge what's going to be the appetite for risk assets and other assets. And, um, this is something that relates to margin because some people just don't need to borrow because they have a ton of cash. So here is a way to look at total liquidity in the system. And uh, we'll start here. This is the total count for US liquid assets. Um, we can see this liquidity measured in trillions of dollars. This is the total saving deposit. So this includes money market deposit, small time accounts, and total money market mutual funds held by both individuals and institutions. Um, this is this COVID move with the Fed and all this fiscal stimulus adding money into the system. Um, money in general has been growing at a staggering rate. So we're, this is just the amount of cash that's out there, just in pure raw numbers. This is $15 trillion. Now, um, we can separate that cash further by going into the amount in interest bearing deposits. Okay, so this would mean almost anything from a bank account to a money market fund. This is just a broad way of M2. M2 is that definition of the money supply. So it includes money markets. And um, you can see that the amount, the blue is what we include in um, the money market funds and larger amounts of money, where this in red is the small time deposits. So before I was asked, is all this QE good or bad? So the answer is, it depends on what side you are. If you're Apple and you're sitting on $208 billion of cash and you have access to infinite amount of sub 1% borrowing, it's probably a good thing because you can generate even more cash and put more cash on to sit on. Um, so before in the 80s and 90s, up to roughly 2000, and if you go back to demographic, that's pretty much when that age wave peaked out and started trending the other way, right? So it all correlates. Um, we, we pretty much had the same amount in small deposits and in the large institutions. Um, it, this, this spread really blew out after the crash when we just had this crazy QE program running away. The divergence between the small time deposit and the large institution and high net worth amount held, held in money market and cash, that is, that is the real issue. That's the real divergence. So there's just a lot of cash on the side, on the sideline, but Main Street America is not really benefiting from that at all. Got it. So if there's a bunch of money on the, on the sidelines, that could mean what? A big run up in asset prices at some point? So let's break this down even further. Here is the money market mutual funds. So straight out like the Vanguard VMXX or whatever, I forgot the ticker. Very large money market mutual funds. So in the time where there's some kind of interest rate, they're making an interest rate. Right now it's zero, so they're not making anything. Um, here is this COVID increase in liquidity. Guess who got a large chunk of it? Obviously, these the institutions. institutions had a big increase in the amount of money being held in, in money market funds. Retail, not so much. So we can see there 07, 09, I mean 08, 09, they raised some cash as the markets were crashing, but a lot of it ended up getting deployed back into, into the markets, right? And then it, they held a certain level of cash. And right now we're sitting on record amount of cash so in money markets alone, the number is 2.8 trillion. Retailers are holding more than a trillion. And you know, remember, the interest rate rate environment is at zero. And that money at some point is going to want to make a return. Got it. So if somebody had, if somebody had a, a thesis that this capital is going to be put to work um, sometime over the course of the next year or two, uh, what type of what type of trades could they go into or what types of um, ways could they uh, put that into action under their accounts? 
Right. So remember, the fact that that's the case now doesn't mean this number is not going to jump even higher and we have a short term top or what, whatever. But at some point, I mean, you got to ask yourself, are they going to just what are they going to do? They're going to buy some stocks. They're going to buy some real estate. They're going to do the same thing that they've done in the past, because at some point you can't sit on these trillions of dollars in zero bearing accounts um, when you have inflation going on and you have such an expansion of the monetary of the monetary system. Got it. Cool. All right. Uh, anybody else got any questions before we hop into our special guest speaker? Perfect. Well, you know, one of the interesting things that one of the interesting things about this group is that we sit in the intersection of people from a whole bunch of different industries and a lot of different uh, leaders who see unique things that all of us don't see every day. Um, our next speaker is Shahid Khan. Shahid is a very good friend of mine. Uh, he is also the co-founder of a company called Loom, which is one of the uh, hottest companies that you'll find in Silicon Valley right now. They play in the world of remote work, and he's going to tell you all about it. But I think what's going to be really interesting about this call is that he gets to see everything that's happening in Silicon Valley. He's building one of the key uh, tools that's allowing us to enable to enabling people to work from home more. So he's definitely in the flow of where things are going. He's going to walk us through a little bit of a history about uh, about remote work and how that kind of came to be and where we're going. And I think for all of you that are thesis driven, you're starting to ask yourself, if I believe that the world is heading in this direction, you really want to pay attention right now because Shahid knows what he's talking about. So without uh, further ado, as they would say, uh, I'd like to introduce you to my buddy Shahid. Hey everyone. Um, thank you, Itai and Jeremy for having me on the webinar. I'm just going to share my screen. Can everyone thank, you, thank you for being here, man. It's, uh, it's great to see you again. This is the second time today. <laughs> Can you all see my screen? Yes. Cool. Thumbs up. Can we all see it? Thumbs up, everybody out there? All right. Perfect. We're looking good, man. Cool. So I'm just going to start off uh, with a quick background on myself um, and then kind of dive into some of the more important topics. So I started Loom with my two co-founders about five years ago. Five years ago, remote work was, uh, you know, not really a thing. Not a lot of people knew about it. It was more seen as luxury rather than necessity, what it, you know, which it is today. Um, but more on that later. Previously, I worked, you know, at uh, two venture capital firms looking at consumer and mobile deals. And prior to that, I was actually a product designer uh, working at Weebly, where I actually lived. For those that uh, are familiar with the Bay Area. I actually lived in San Mateo and our office was in San Francisco. Um, and it's about an hour and 10 minutes door to door. So one day out of the week, I would actually be working remotely. Um, that was kind of like the, the inception and the idea of how um, we started to think about Loom. So um, a little bit more on Loom. Loom is the most effective way for you to get your message across no matter where you work or where you live. Uh, we started the company about five years ago. We have uh, 4 million users and 80,000 active companies using Loom today. And those companies range from your two-person startup all the way up to Slack, who um, is one of our investors, uh, to Accenture, JP Morgan, and so on and so forth. Um, and these are some of our investors. But more importantly, I would love to just give you a quick demo of Loom just so you have a better understanding of how it works. This is a video I had actually recorded um, and it was actually walking through one of my coworkers through um, a company that we're actually selling to. So you could see if I just play this video, I don't wanna have the audio run through it while I'm talking to you, so I'm just gonna mute that. Um, but you could see there's a little camera, you could see my face, you see my screen, and you could actually hear my audio. So for in instances where, you know, if we have an engineer or a sales rep who's actually in New Zealand, um, our time zones are completely flipped given I live in the Bay Area. So oftentimes Zoom calls don't make sense. So rather what we decided was, you know, we want to build this product that allows people to record their screen, their audio and their microphone, and then send that as an asynchronous video. So when the engineer, the sales rep wakes up in New Zealand, they'll be able to consume this content and move on with their day. And I think the genius too of what, uh, what Shahid and his team did is they made this right through a browser extension. So 
you know, someone like me could get, you know, this video installed, right? Or I could, I could, I could see a loom, I could install it right in on my Chrome, like I have now. And then I click a button and I'm recording everything on my screen. So it's very, very easy to use and very easy to share. And I think that's one of the reasons you've had so much success. Totally. Um, and with, you know, even with what we're seeing today uh, with COVID, I think, you know, some of you probably heard stories about how Zoom has just become this new age social network where, you know, a lot, like even, I mean, I'm a victim of it. I actually hosted my birthday over a Zoom call uh, just so all my friends can call in given, you know, the pandemic. Um, but even with Zoom, along with a lot of these remote enabling tools, you know, uh, at Loom, we've seen a 3x, you know, multiple on all of our growth metrics, uh, similar to Zoom and similar to a lot of these companies, which we'll, you know, get into in a second. And that's just during your COVID times? Just during COVID. So, you know, the, the past three months really makes the former four years look like nothing. Um, I think in the three months, we, you know, we've just kind of skyrocketed um, in, in growth across, across all spectrums. Cool. Um, but just to give a quick recap, because I know, you know, we're talking to a broader audience on this call. Um, not a lot of us are, you know, uh, you know, familiar with how certain companies had sprung up. But, you know, just to kind of give, you know, those a refresher, Dropbox company started in 2007, a company that a lot of us are familiar with today, uh, was actually, not a lot of people know this, but it was actually started as a consumer facing product. Um, and it took them about, you know, seven to eight years to realize that there's a massive market, you know, had they just shifted more into uh, business customers. So as people know today, you know, Dropbox enables anyone to seamlessly store on the cloud and share files with the link. Prior to this, you know, prior to Dropbox and file sharing, there was a lot of, you know, on-premises solutions, um, which we'll also talk about in a second, but they had grew, you know, specifically focusing on the Dropbox for business part, because I feel like that's what's most relatable to this conversation. They grew Dropbox business from zero to 14 million paying customers from 2016 to 2019. Unbelievable. And then similarly with Slack, um, another company that we, you know, a lot of us know today was actually a pivot from a failing video game company. Um, and then over a hack weekend, the team, you know, that ultimately created Slack decided that they wanted to build an internal communication tool and as they saw like, you know, how valuable this was to their interpersonal communication, uh, they released this to a number of teams and that was kind of like how uh, Slack had launched. And they went from zero to 10 million daily active workplace users from 2014 to 2019 as well. Um, but I guess the, the key thing he here is, you know, we often forget like what we did before these products existed. Um, so it's, it's crazy to think about, you know, even before Dropbox, we would share files through a VPN, maybe a USB stick, uh, floppy disks for those that remember floppy disks. And, you know, sometimes we would also email attachments back and forth. However, you know, if, if, I'm a, if I'm a lawyer and I have a client and we need to exchange files, email is probably not the best method for us to send that content over. This is obviously pre-Dropbox. Um, just given like security concerns, this was before, you know, two-factor authentication was a thing, before single sign-on was a thing. Um, so, you know, if you're fortunate enough to have a fax machine at home, you'd probably get a fax from your lawyer with the, you know, the proper documents. Um, luckily, that's not the case today. Today, you know, you can easily upload a file, share that link. The file is always going to be up to date, regardless of whoever makes changes to that file. But the important piece here is that it's accessible from anywhere and any time. Um, similarly with Slack, you know, prior to real-time messaging, we would send emails, we would actually schedule meetings, whether, you know, if it's like a sales meeting where we'd have to fly to a physical location to have that meeting, um, or, you know, if it's just like in our own office, a lot of things that, you know, could have been conversed over what now is Slack and like a 10 minute back and forth exchange, we'd actually book time on someone's calendar to get those things across. Um, so luckily, you know, today with Slack, we have the ability to chat in real time, share files, images, videos, and again, you know, it's accessible from anywhere and any time. And I think that just like a, just like a Netflix. Yes, correct. And I think that the beauty of you know the highlighted point uh, here is that these two were essentially byproducts um, built by companies like Slack and Dropbox 
uh, that actually enabled and encouraged people to work from home. So, you know, for me living in San Mateo, working at Weebly, you know, when we had Dropbox and when we had, you know, Slack was just starting up at that time, this is in 2014, um, I was now allowed to work from home because as a product designer, I would actually be able to save my files to our Dropbox, our company Dropbox, and our other designers that were working from the office would easily be able to access that uh, in real time. So looking at like the general market, you know, I would say 95% of these companies that are all remote enabled companies were built in the last decade. So Zoom built in the last decade, you know, a lot of companies uh, on the technical side, we have companies like GitLab and GitHub that enable engineers to do their work, uh, you know, seamlessly, whether you're an engineer in, again, like Europe and, you know, you have someone here in the States, you can always just commit your code and you know, it's always up to date in that manner. Um, so from project management to HR benefits, team management, uh, collaboration and knowledge sharing, messaging and communication, a lot of these products um, and including Figma, you know, which is kind of revolutionizing uh, you know, product design and kind of taking over Adobe, Adobe as a suite tool um, is also you know, built in the cloud. So, so the infrastructure is getting a lot better to work from home. 100%. And I think, you know, these were all, you know, I would say like the, the massive shift from on-premises, uh, you know, product building and, you know, going to a physical office to install software on people's computers and the emergence that we've kind of seen, you know, towards cloud computing, you know, has really like, kind of going back to that point, it was a byproduct of enabling a lot of these people to work from home. So just a snapshot of where we are now. Uh, a report, you know, done by IWG in 2018, you know, showed that 70% of the world's, uh, and to be clear, knowledge workers, um, those that are able to get, you know, work done on, on their computers, 70% uh, of that world's population works remotely at least once a week, and 53% of them work at least half the week uh, remotely. And then in 2019, Zoom, you know, reported that they had about uh, just under, you know, 51,000 customers that had more than 10 employees signed onto a contract with Zoom. And that was a 5X increase from, you know, two years prior. Um, so that, you know, that is kind of an indicator that, you know, uh, even though Google Hangouts and a lot of these, you know, Skype weren't really built for remote communication, whereas Zoom was, you know, really thinking about the end user experience, like that one-to-one -one experience rather than Google Hangouts, which was really focusing on like office to office. Um, you know, just seeing that kind of growth really showed that, you know, a lot of people were trending in this direction. And then obviously, you know, in 2020, COVID-19, uh, that was kind of a remote work tipping point where hundreds of millions of people were essentially forced to work from home. Um, and if we want to get into more COVID, you know, data as it relates to remote work, you know, I, I have a study. I, I want to point out one thing that really, really uh, hits home for me. Just this stat that you have in 2018 that says 53% of people are, just in 2018, they were already working from home at least half of the week. So when I look at a trend, once it gets that high, to me, it looks like a foregone conclusion that that is absolutely the future. So if we were sitting there in 2018 and things have only gotten better and now we're at COVID, this is, it, I, I feel like it's safe to say, like this is a permanent shift. You know, the, the days of going into the office are toast. What do you feel about that? Yeah, no, I, I think I think that's completely. Um, I think that's a very a very reasonable statement. Um, oftentimes, you know, I guess like the bigger pressing question and like the thought that a lot of people have is this. You know, the the whole shift from working, you know, working from home during this pandemic is a temporary shift. But you know, during in the last two months, a lot of people, you know, what a lot of people have done has been you know, they built habits and they built a lifestyle around working from home where, you know, they would probably go out and get groceries on a Tuesday in between two meetings, whereas before they'd have to do it on the weekend. Um, so now there's a lot more flexibility with people's schedules. And I think that is going to be a forcing function for employees kind of uh, demanding this, you know, at least like a partial work from home split, just given the amount of time they save the amount of time that they, you know, are able to like now spend with family. It's like the benefits, you know, kind of outweigh a lot of the cons here. 
Um, and one thing that I like to tell a lot of people is, you know, especially right now, remote work isn't the future of work, it's the present. Um, COVID-19 has been a big kind of accelerator of that, uh, as mo you know, more and more people are going to realize. And this is actually a study done by Slack. You know, they studied about 3,000 people. And of the 3,000 people, it was just, you know, laying out how many people are able to work from home uh, based on the, the difficulty of their work. So you can see, you know, accounting and finance down to arts and design, you know, with the dark purple can work from home with little to no difficulty was roughly 60 to 65 percent of the people surveyed said that they're fine working from home. Um, and then, you know, you also see another surprising statistic when I looked at this graph was the number of healthcare services workers that actually said they're able to work from home. So with, you know, the infrastructure behind telemedicine, live video conferencing between a doctor and a patient, uh, even seeing that kind of surge during this time has been, you know, another leading kind of indicator of where uh, this remote work economy is actually going. So you're seeing, I'm seeing from that, that more, major, way more than half of those industries are all saying it's relatively easy to work from home. Yeah. And actually one thing that, I, um, it actually makes sense to jump in this right now. So this was actually a study, let me blow this up. Um, this was a study done by the University of Washington, just on the uh, parallels that we can draw between COVID-19 and remote work. And in this chart, you could see like of the working respondents, People who could you could you zoom in a little bit more yeah. so we can see it? It looks a little small. Perfect. Yeah. Better gang, thumbs up. All right, so, Grace, got it. Thank you. So, of the working respondents, people who used to commute that now are forced to work from home was roughly thirty, almost thirty-five percent of people. Um, and then you know, people who continue to commute to work—that's obviously you know, um, whether it's your pharmacist at CVS or you know. Um, someone that works at a bakery that is considered an essential business. Uh, a lot of these people have to show up. But for those, you know, in the industry, what we call knowledge workers, those that are just able to, you know, hop online, get their work done, and sign off for the day, uh, those are like the people that we're kind of focusing on in this in this data. Um, and those, you know, that obviously used to work from home and still do, you know, still a big portion. Um, and then unfortunately, there have been people that were also for a load that were in this uh, data as well. But, you know, the, the beauty of this is like this study actually really slices the data based on region, based on, you know, uh, income levels. So I'm happy to, you know, send this along when Jeremy and Itai send out their um, weekly email. But just one other chart I want to run through really quickly before we go into the other slides. Based on region, this also very important for you know, those that are in real estate, looking at the number of people who are going to be moving towards working from home a lot more. Um, and this is also gonna be a big driving factor uh, in later slides as we talk about you know, what's gonna happen to cities like San Francisco, to cities like New York City, um, where people you know, are essentially moving to these cities for work. Um, whereas now we might start seeing a trend in people actually moving away from these larger cities to potentially second tier cities, um, since it's more affordable and you get a lot more space. But I just thought this chart was also um, pretty fascinating as well. That's awesome. And then, we'll, we'll, and I'm, go for it, Itai. Yeah, no, I, I was seeing in the chat that there are a lot of people that say that, you know, working from home, people see it as a kind of vacation and things like that. So I just wanted to interject and say, well, I think that some people are just not used to managing people from home and there are a lot of tools and you guys know more than me like asana and other things like that that measure productivity and you mark up objectives and you know when you when you um when you do something you mark it off as checked and i read a bloomberg article um from this weekend that says that they monitored a bunch of u.s workers and they actually found out that the Work work life balance has been completely destroyed by COVID nineteen, and the average worker is now actually logging in three hours a day more work than before because everybody has the assumption that they're slacking off, so they're actually working the hardest they've ever worked. So my my question to Shahid would actually be how do you how do you engage in the work life balance and make sure that people are not going nuts? Yeah, no, I, I think I think that's a that's a great question, um, and I think as part of the data, you know, one thing that kind of goes uh, un, unaccounted for is 
you know, people are just used to waking up, you know, early in the morning, they have their commute to the office, commute back from the office that is now being just spent, you know, hopping on the computer and starting work immediately. So those two hours that you're normally spending, you know, commuting is now being spent towards like actually getting work done. Um, but I think, you know, while like technology is kind of catching up to um, real life scenarios, it's going to be interesting to see how do we, you know, without micromanaging our team, how do we, you know, kind of enable them and, you know, have them motivated enough to feel like a, you know, it's a lot like a lot of the drawbacks with remote work are like self isolation, the feeling of loneliness, um, no sense of community, which is like what we get in the office, lunch break, you know, like break rooms, a lot of that stuff kind of uh, suppresses those um, isolation, um, you know, emotions. But I think there's going to be a lot of room for, you know, a company or, you know, some service to come in and build in that sector, um, whether it's HR benefits, you know, maybe we're starting to see a lot of companies pick up uh, mental health as like a HR benefit. So they're willing to subsidize part of your mental health costs. Um, if you do go out and, you know, like you're paying for, um, say, like an app like Calm, um, or if you're seeing a therapist, things like that. So I think, you know, through whether it's benefits internally within your company, they're going to be more adjusted towards remote working. Um, and then also just around like project management, I think there's going to be slightly more discipline and uh, transparency um, in like the type and the amount of work that's getting done. Got it. Cool. Thanks for sharing that. And, Sh and Shaw, did you have any other slides that you wanted to go through on this? Uh, I think maybe just what does this mean going forward? Yeah, um, just one more. And it's more around discussion. Um, and then I just wanted to show something. But I also want to make sure that I leave enough time for people. Um, so I'm just going to uh, go through the next slide real quick. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what does this mean? Like, you know, obviously there's this big shift. Everyone's kind of aware about it, but what does this mean for, you know, the macroeconomic trends as this continues to, um, you know, like as these tailwinds of remote work continue to push forward. So, like I mentioned earlier, you know, there's probably going to be a shift from city living to second tier cities, even maybe suburbs or even co-living nomad. Uh, for those that are familiar, you know, there's a company called Common where you can essentially subscribe and pay a monthly fee and you can live at any one of their locations uh, anywhere in the world, anywhere there is a, you know, a common uh, living building. Um, but I think you know, another important piece uh, to think about is oftentimes these knowledge workers, those that are you know, moving for jobs, like you know, coming to work at Google in Mountain View, California, leaving you know, Chicagoland, um, I think it's gonna become a pretty foreign thought in the next five years for people to move to a tier one city like San Francisco or New York City uh, for a knowledge working job. So, you know, anything around engineering, accounting, finance, um, banking, uh, anywhere, you know, where people relocate to, I think it's gonna be a pretty foreign so thought there. I wanna interrupt you real quick. I think what you just said there is like one of the things that's really been hitting me the, the hardest. So for a knowledge worker, a high earner, you're saying that five years from now, the thought that they're gonna leave uh, they're going to move somewhere for a job and go to that city is going to be absolutely ludicrous and bonkers. So for me, that makes me think, okay, well, wherever these people set up, real economies are going to form around them and great opportunities. It also tells me that, you know, like, what does that mean for some of these like big cities and the colder places that, you know, may not have what a Denver has with the mountains or and may not have what an Austin has with the weather. You know, and I, I, I can't but help but sit here as a millennial, as one of the people in these knowledge working spaces and say, hey, I don't, I, I see a mass exodus from those type of places to places that are more affordable and just have a better style of life because they can still make as much money. Um, and then it even goes further if they're in, a, in one of these places that is less desired. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a um, pretty true statement and, and you know, analogy to draw. Um, and I mean, you know, along with, along with that, you know, if you look at commercial real estate, like what does this mean about, you know, office leases, office supplies, what does that mean about companies like Xerox that produce these large industrial printers for office buildings, um, you know, and even down to like cleaning services and, you know, just thinking about businesses that supply a service or a product uh, specifically catered to offices, um, you know, what does that kind of mean for them? Um, you know, what, what will the financial district look like? You know, obviously there's going to be 
Um, it's actually an interesting thought, you know, worthy to bring up here. You know, law firms, most of their costs are actually associated with the real estate that they're, you know, um, their office buildings, like my corporate counsel, um, but, you know, our initial corporate counselor was uh, headquartered in the Salesforce Tower. And you can just imagine like how much of what I'm paying him, his hourly rate is associated with just like them having six floors in this massive building. Um, we had then actually moved towards a different law firm who is their whole edge is like, you know, they're relatively cheaper because they don't have any offices and they all just work remotely. So their services, you know, they've cut down their costs because they don't have to pay for um, an office lease. Um, so that's just like an interesting thing to think about. Um, but going to my next point, you know, kind of rushing through this since I know I'm limited on time here, cyber IT security, you know, huge, about, huge. Yeah, the huge. shift from on-premises to cloud. Um, however, there are still, you know, there's still a big forcing function, especially for a lot of your enterprise companies. They prefer to have things built, you know, and downloaded on their corporate laptops. Um, just, you know, for pure security, there's less of a way for, you know, uh, breaches to happen. You know, cloud is very uh, vulnerable to breaching. So, you know, you're going to have to think about that as a, as a market opportunity, um, whether you're investing or planning on starting something. You know, how does cyber IT security get affected in the long term, especially when a lot of these companies go remote? Uh, uh, Shahid, I had a really good question. I'm sorry I'm interrupting. Sure. But one of the questions says, what, is, what does this remote work mean for the average American in terms of job safety? Great question. That was going to be my last point after travel industry. I had it listed around here because I think that's like a, uh, like a bigger thing to think about. You know, not everyone has obviously the luxury of working from home. Um, but what does that mean for people who, you know, are a barista? I think this was in it, like one that was brought up by Itai. Like, what does that mean for, you know, the difference, your separation between your white collar and blue collar workers um, and like the income disparity and just in general, like, you know, the barista still has to show up to work. Um, so there isn't necessarily a conclusion that I'm, you know, drawing towards with that, but I think it's just something worthy, you know, to think about, especially as people, you know, start working more remotely. One, you know, one can say that because I'm working more remotely, I want to get out more. I want to, you know, take more walks because I need to have like a, um, I just need to refresh my brain, you know, after a long meeting and I've probably stopped by the grocery store or stopped by, you know, the coffee shop that I probably wouldn't have stopped by if I went to the office because uh, we get coffee at the office. So I think, you know, there's a lot of, um, you can, you can pick either side of that, um, but I think it's, it's a really, it's just a really good thought to, um, to think through. That makes total what, sense. What does that mean in terms of wages? Because we, we've already seen like earlier in the chart where you have uh, the institutions and the big guys sitting on monstrous amounts of cash where everybody else is just depleting more and more and more. So do you think that this accelerates potentially the high earners making even more money? Or do you think that the way I see it too, alternatively, is that if everybody works remote, why are we still hiring an American where we can hire somebody in Eastern Europe that can code just as well and make half as much? Do we see a level off of salaries across the globe? Yep, great question. I mean, just one um, data point to draw. At Loom, we have about 75, uh, approaching 75 employees, half of which are remote. And I would say of that half, another half are actually international. So we have you know, engineers in, you know, throughout Europe, we have um, people in uh, New Zealand. We have some just kind of all scattered, you know, in Australia. Um, and for us as a business, you know, hiring, you know, engineering talent is obviously it's just too expensive in San Francisco. So we, by necessity, when we were a much smaller company, prior to raising any venture capital, we had to get creative and hire people outside of you know our our typical hiring roadmap. Um, but I mean, it's a great, you know, it's a great question. It's, you know, uh, and it's something to think about for, you know, companies, especially these smaller startups, um, you know, kind of going against the Googles and the Facebooks, they have to get really creative and have a really low burn. Therefore they start to hire people in Europe. Um, and thus, you know, you kind of have this uh, ripple effect where, you know, now a lot of, you know, there's, I would say there's gonna be like a central base or a headquarter for any one given company, 
But outside of that small office, you know, they're probably going to have a lot of distributed people kind of spread across the globe. Because the way I think about it, that already happened with, you know, the rise of China and all the stuff that's happened after uh, 19, the 1970s when China opened up to the world and everybody was going out there. And that kind of is what killed Detroit and all those places because it was a, a leveling off on those wages that literally came out of the, the Midwest and the US and went all the way into China and all those places in their middle class. They, they've rose 500 million people into the middle class in China. So are we gonna see basically now all the American knowledge workers not making those six figures more and kind of wages leveling off across the globe because of this remote term? I mean, I think that's a real possibility. Yeah, I mean, one, you know, as demand is kind of, you know, increasing and you have a, like an exponentially larger amount of supply, just expanding the bounds of where you're hiring from, I think you start to see, you know, the demands I catch up to it. Um, so I think just the leveling off of finding, you know, talent is just going to become ideally for companies ubiquitous as you can really just hire anyone from anywhere because the infrastructure is there for them to do their best work. And that will potentially level off the income disparity that we're seeing. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, you know, fintech, you know, it's going to be interesting just, just for y'all to think about, you know, like, what does this mean about currency conversion, especially if I'm, you know, nomad kind of just traveling from place to place. Um, what does that mean about banking, you know, restrictions, laws, auto industry, are people more you know, you could kind of take either side of this argument. Are people going to be buying more cars because they want to get out more and they want to travel more, you know, get up and go to Tahoe for the weekend? Or because they're not commuting anymore, does that mean that uh, the auto industry is going to see a decline? So, you know, that's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see play out um, the next uh, couple of years. But then also the travel industry, some people are coming off bearish given COVID um, with the travel industry, but I'm actually... From the purely remote work standpoint, I'm bullish on the travel industry, just given I think people are going to be willing to travel more uh, simply because they don't need to be at any one specific location to get their work done. I could totally see that. Totally see that. All, all the consultants and all the business travel that takes place because of, I think a ton of the domestic travel that takes place is these um, you know business meetings and people going from one place to another. That's a great point. Yeah. Well, Shahid, thank you so much for uh, going into that. I think that was excellent. Uh, I know we ran a little bit over everybody. We're going to stay on for another five minutes or so. Uh, we can open this up to Q&A about anything in the world that you want. So everybody who's there, uh, I would say feel free. Start asking away. I'm curious about any studies you've seen about the percentage of people in these first tier cities that are living there because of a job. You know, you use an example like Jeremy or myself. We moved to Austin because we wanted to. And obviously, there's people that do that proactively with any city. Um, have you seen any studies around the, the numbers there? Um, I haven't. I haven't dove into any specific studies, but I think that's a it's a great question. Um, and it's it's so it's interesting because like oftentimes, so I moved from San Mateo to San Francisco. Just given younger, it's like more nightlife. More there's just so much more for uh, a millennial in San Francisco than a suburb. But you, you're now, I mean, if you're like in the Bay Area, you will see the entire peninsula from San Francisco to San Jose has been completely, I mean, the amount of rent increase and like the, the, the value in homes has just dramatically increased. And it's been just like a while to see Box, you know, initially they were, uh, the company Box, um, they were headquartered in Redwood City, they moved up to San Mateo. And now a lot of families purchased homes, purchased apartments. Um, oftentimes you hear about, you know, like friends that are moving uh, to the Bay Area for work because they got a job offer, you know, like the husband or the wife or both got a job offer to go work at Google or Intel. Um, and oftentimes they tend to move more south. So in like San Jose, Mountain View, like true Silicon Valley. Um, but, you know, you'll also see like a lot of people just commuting back and forth from uh, the office. So it's actually, while there aren't that many, studies, I would say it's, it's been a very common trend amongst a lot of the larger Silicon Valley companies, but it's going to be interesting to see if there's any real data out there. I mean, just to put it lightly, I mean, I'm a living example of, you know, I moved to San Francisco um, to, uh, you know, at one point to start a company, but I had moved out here seven years ago. And the first two years I was working at Weebly, I was working at a venture capital firm. 
and I was here because I felt like I had to be here to get my work done. But now with like, you know, the info that we talked about, I think it's going to, you know, enable people like me and like others to just live wherever and do the same amount of work. Can I jump in with a question? Yep. Uh, so uh, really awesome presentation. Um, I'm based here in Chicago and, uh, you know, big question that I hear a lot is, have we reached like peak Silicon Valley? Like, does it, does it have to be Silicon Valley if you want to be a, a young founder and build a startup now? Or, or do you see that being easier to do in other parts of the country? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually interesting given like this has been always a question, you know, over the last decade is like, is Silicon Valley defensible? You know, people have come up with terms like Silicon Alley and uh, a number of different, you know, there's like Silicon Beach, which was LA. Um, I think the, the importance of the Bay Area is while it's becoming easier for people to start and hire, you know, start companies outside of Silicon Valley and hire people outside of Silicon Valley, I think while that's all true, I think there's something about Silicon Valley, you know, the people, the network, you know, all the venture firms, all of the, like the technology, you know, if you're selling into people, you know, if you're selling to specific types of customers, you're most likely just going to be doing like a quick tour of Market Street to you know meet with like the nine companies that you're like looking to sell to. Um, I think, and there was actually Sam Altman, the president, former president of Y Combinator, you know, one of the uh, best startup accelerators in the world, kind of birthed Airbnb, Dropbox, and a number of other companies, uh, came out and said that he's going to start seeing a trend where oftentimes these startup companies are going to have, even if it's a small office, just like a headquarter in San Francisco, but are mainly going to have their employees distributed across the world. Um, so I think even if you start a company outside of San Francisco, say Chicago, I think, you know, the, the, um, the necessity or the ability to fundraise and raise from, you know, the firms like Andreessen Horowitz and Sequoia, I feel like people are still going to travel to do that here, um, but then are going to go back and, you know, continue to operate their businesses from Chicago, wherever they are. Absolutely. Uh, Rob, you had a question about the end game of healthcare. Yeah, I'm just, you know, we had a lot of coverage on healthcare tonight. And so I know like Etel, you had that really good trade on Boston properties that we continue to follow is with the growth in healthcare, you know, what are some of the investment opportunities uh, well, if you like, I can cover some of that next week. If you have a specific trade you're thinking about in mind, I can look into structuring it. Thank you. Cool. All right. Uh, any, any, anybody else got a question from the audience? I think uh, Itai's asked me now a few times the other Itai, anybody know about the legalities of IT companies hiring internationals remotely without work visas? Is there anybody here that has any insight on that? Do you need a work visa to hire somebody remotely outside the U.S.? Why would you? I mean, I've hired hundreds of VAs in my life, and I never had any issue. You can literally go to places. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar, but I'll send it Upwork.com, and this is a this is a little uh, a little hack that I use. I'll actually go on Upwork when I want a task done. I'll hire ten people. I'll give them a five dollar test. And I'll have them run the same test and the people that do the best job over the course of like two or three days, I literally take one or two of them. So try that out. Uh, you can find some great talent there. Jeremy, when you, this is Richie, uh, when you do that, isn't that you, you're not officially hiring them as a employee though, aren't you contracting out? So isn't that yeah. considered different? Uh, that's a great point. Yeah, I, I, I am contracting them out there, uh, but I can tell them exactly what I want and they can, they can do it. Uh, usually most of these people are sitting somewhere in like the Philippines, mm -hmm. somewhere in Southeast Asia. Uh, I mean, wh wherever they are. And I just kind of take a look at their English proficiency and their overall reviews. I don't have personal experience with this, but from the, I'm the, uh, pretty much the only family from my dad, my mom's side that came here from India. So most of my cousins that have moved here to work, most of them work in Silicon Valley, all as pretty much software engineers. <laughs> and, um, yeah. But I have other cousins in India that are actually working for Google, uh, BCG, companies like that, um, because those companies have platforms in India, right? So for because sure. they're for already sure. set up out there, then, I mean, they don't necessarily need a work visa because the company already, already has the infrastructure. Yeah. So yeah. I forgot who asked it, but I don't think, 
the visa situation is big and with everything Shahid, excuse me, Shahid uh, mentioned, I mean, that virtual work will just continue, I think, to exponentially grow that to where even people from India, do they really need to come to America now for that job? They can steal our jobs without coming to America. They can just stay there and do it. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Well, there's certain things that aren't going to be able to be outsourced. So Christian, uh, I don't know if you're still there on the phone, but it sounds like from a DOD perspective, uh, any of this outsourced stuff is an absolute no-go. That, but that's a small percentage. That's very, <laughs> that's true. Okay. Well, I, I, I see a big trend in actually going to Eastern Europe because you have a really top quality engineers and stuff like that there versus uh, I've heard in India and, and things like that. I don't know if I was... Yeah. I mean, the things that the things that I was like seeing is like, yeah, there are definitely some good engineers out there. But I think one of the other things that I also like too is the time zones were important for people that actually needed to have people on at the same time, and then they were going to more of the South Americas of the world. So I think it really just depends on you know what you're doing, um, you know, uh, what type of skill set you need. I mean, if I was a uh, prime minister of Hungary or or Portugal or one of those countries, I would just start giving uh, just you know, free visa permits for remote work. Maybe that's a new kind of visa that's going to just come up for people of other other countries to be able to go to other countries if they want to just work out, work there. And yep. I think that'd be awesome. Great, cool. Well, everybody, we appreciate you hanging on. Uh, I know we went a little bit long. I just want to give a big thank you to Shahid. Shahid, your presentation was awesome. And it got me definitely thinking about where the future is going. And I think all of you uh, want to be considering, you know, the future as you're, you know, thinking about your own investments. So uh, we're gonna hang on for just a few more minutes. I know a lot of people like to hang out, uh, get off here, but if you had a private question you wanna ask, we'll still be around for a little bit. And we wanna say thank you so much. Uh, next week, we'll be back at Monday at the same time, and we're gonna have another great guest speaker for you. So thank you all again for showing up. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, Shade. Thank you. you. Got it. <laughs>